how's it going? Good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to meet with you here once again. I was very frustrated this evening because I couldn't find any news. I went to the Daily Mail and instead of giving me interesting things to talk about, they gave me a celebrity headline, which I have come to learn means that there is no news according to the Daily Mail. And indeed, on a lot of other sites, there are very much like odds and ends, bits and pieces of news. So we're going to try to piece it together today, see what we come up with. I'm sure we'll have a great time. Thank you guys all so much for joining me. Hello, Stuart. Hello, Unhighly Snipes. Hello, Tommy Temper. Appreciate you being here. Whisper, appreciate you as well. Um, Andy says, this day in history, March 8th, Reagan referred to the Soviet Union as the evil empire. Well, that is a good legacy for today, indeed. The other part about today is that it is International Women's Day, which means, of course, that the Biden administration is giving biological men medals to celebrate their value as women, which is very, very gratifying, very reassuring, and makes me feel great about being a lady in this day and age. Today, Andy and I were debating back and forth about whether we have to be compassionate with people, uh, on people, for people, not not on people. Don't be compassionate on people. I don't think that's legal. Whether we could, should be compassionate uh, with people with whom we deeply ideologically do disagree. And I said, you know, some of these people think that I should be actually literally silenced, that my life should be miserable. All of these different things they've threatened, they've tried to do, they've tried to make sure that biological, actual, real women can't speak because they believe that trans women are more important. And I was like, I don't feel like they deserve niceness. And Andy's point was that it's not about niceness and it's not for them, it's for us. So, Compassion is still the name of the game, even though I know it's sometimes hard. Um, I think that you can push people to view the truth as objectively reasonable and still be kind about it. I've always thought that. I've always thought that there are ways to express truths to people that are also not unkind. Um, And I know lots of edgy people like to say, well, I'm just being truthful. No, you're not. There are ways to do that without being a jerk. And people don't seem to put those two together. So smash the like button. Make sure you're subscribed. Share this with your pals. Uh, Whisper says, how is everyone today? I've been sorting through my craft items to get rid of. It can be hard. Indeed. I'm very sorry to hear that. Serenko says, what's up, everyone? Not a lot, apparently. And the news seems to agree with us. So let's just go ahead and hop right into it. I'm going to start with this tweet from Greg Price. And we're just going to hodgepodge patchwork our way through it today. Tucker, not one working journalist has asked me for copies of the January 6th tape, and instead I'm getting all these texts asking me, I'm Sarah Ellis from the Washington Post. Is it true you suck? So let's watch this segment from Glenn Beck. Hopefully they don't give us a copyright strike. We make sure the volume is up on this guy. There we go. When you got all the tapes, um, can... It did, did Fox News, the news department, can they have access to that? Would they get access to that? Do you think, I mean, what do we do with these tapes now? Because now it's your word again. You know, that's a good question. I can, I, you know, we work independently. We work for the same company you've worked here, you know, and, know. but they really are in different silos. I can say that no one from any news organization that I'm aware of, I can't speak for my producers, but that as far as I know, no one has ever no one ever asked can 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 i ask right now can i get access to those but as far as i'm concerned you can have access to whatever you want i mean i personally think that everyone should have access to them just i'll put you in touch with my producer uh who's been dealing with um the speaker's office for sure I mean, so, wait a minute so so nobody nobody from the news department any news department contacted and said hey tucker what do you what are you seeing? What do you got? No Not way. one working journalist has texted me directly and everybody in the world, including my UPS delivery guy, has my text. Nobody doesn't have my text. I mean, I should just announce it on your show. Everybody has <laughs> So I am the easiest person to get in touch with. I've had the same phone since 1995, the same phone number. I never change it. I respond to every text every day. So I am not hard to get in touch with at all. I'm not Colonel Kurtz up the Mekong, okay? I'm just sitting in my backyard. And nobody has reached, and, and I was in mainstream journalism for 25 years, so I know everybody. 
Nobody has asked me. And instead, I'm getting all these texts like, I'm Sarah Ellison from the Washington Post. Is it true that you suck? <laughs> uh, the White House is issued a statement today saying you're a white supremacist Nazi. Would you care to comment? Yeah, so that really doesn't surprise me. What I've seen from most modern mainstream media is just that they are incredibly incurious to anything that does not suit the current narrative. I know, I'm disappointed that I don't have Tucker's text either, for sure. Sir Ranko points out that he doesn't have Tucker's t- um, text, which I'm assuming means his phone number, which I would love to be in touch with Tucker Carlson. I think that would be awesome. I would ask him all sorts of questions and have a lot of fun communicating with him, but not everyone. So that is fake news on Tucker's part. I don't have his text message. I would have loved to have gotten him on to Timcast IRL. But as I was saying, I really have noticed that the mainstream media has absolutely zero curiosity to anything that falls even slightly outside of their one particular very narrow narrative. Like, It's genuinely kind of flummoxing to me. I'm not the most curious person in the world. I'm really not very nosy. I don't ask a lot of questions. But at the same time, if you're going to be a journalist, why do you not want to ask questions? Are you sure you should be a journalist if you're not asking questions? That's the real question at the end of the day. By the way, I do think that camera angle on um, Glenn's show here is so interesting. I have no idea why you would point a camera up at the back of his head. That's so interesting to me because you can see everything he's looking at, which is really interesting. But what are they trying to convey here that he drinks like Sonic big gulps or whatever? Those big, big, tall foam cups from Sonic? Really interesting. Anyway, there's more news about the January 6th release. Tucker Carlson reveals Ray Epps lied in sworn testimony to January 6th committee. This actually came out yesterday, but I think it's really important to mention because I wanted to cover all the points for you guys that Tucker covered on his show from the, um, from the footage from the surveillance tapes on January 6th. Carlson said the videos prove the politicians and the media were lying about the events that occurred on January 6th. Yes, he should say that because that's exactly what happened. Fox News host Tucker Carlson released never-before-seen footage Monday night from the January 6, 2021 riot at the U.S. Capitol that appears to disprove national narratives, excuse me, narratives championed by the media and the House Select Committee. Last month, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy gave Carlson over 40,000 hours of security camera footage from the Capitol building that had been kept hidden from the public for over two years. Carlson said that the video proves that politicians and the media were lying about the events that occurred January 6th. Some of the footage released Monday showed Ray Epps, the man caught on video, encouraging Trump supporters to enter the Capitol building the night before the January 6th riot on the grounds at least 30 minutes after the time he originally claimed when he testified before the House Select Committee about a text he sent his nephew earlier in which Epps claimed he was heading back to his hotel. Jack Posobiec says breaking Tucker Carlson just confirmed Ray Epps lied about his whereabouts on January 6th in sworn testimony. According to Carlson, the false claim to congressional investigators is itself a crime. Epps has not been criminally charged, which has fueled speculation that he had coordinated with the FBI before the riot. Other footage showed Trump supporters peacefully looking around the building and queuing up in lines. Carlson referred to them as sightseers. That's exactly what they look like. If you guys have seen some of this footage, there's a really funny voiceover that Luke Luke Rudkowski posted on his Twitter. I was like, thank you for joining Capitol um, sightseeing tours. Make sure that you stay within the velvet ropes. Make sure that you line up in orderly fashion. Here is our fancy dress winner, Jacob Chansley. He is going to be escorted for his own private tour, which was literally something that happened. Like he was, he had several police officers, several Capitol Police officers with him inside the building while he was just wandering around. Carlson noted that the one point in the foot at one point in the footage, at least nine police officers were seen near Chansley, but none of them attempted to stop him. Yet he was sentenced to nearly four years in prison for quote knowingly entering or remaining 
in a restricted building or grounds without lawful authority and with violent entry and disorderly conduct on capital grounds. That appears to be fully untrue. It doesn't look like he entered in a violent or disorderly fashion. It doesn't look like he was under any impression that he didn't have the lawful authority to be there because he was literally accompanied by nine different officers as he just kind of wandered around at the Capitol building. The tapes show the Capitol Police never stopped Jacob Chansley, Carlson stated. They helped him. They acted as his tour guides. The Fox News host asked if he, Chansley, was in fact committing such a grave crime, why didn't the officers who were standing right next to him place him under arrest? The media and Democrats have continued to promote the narrative of a deadly insurrection on January 6th, citing the death of a police officer. We know that's not true. While some of the others died of natural causes, the only person who was killed that day was Air Force veteran and Trump supporter Ashley Babbitt who was shot by a Capitol Police officer. The media alleged that Officer Brian Sicknick was attacked by the rioters and even falsely claimed was hit in the head with a fire extinguisher. Sicknick was seen in the footage described by Carlson as healthy and vigorous while guiding Trump supporters out of the building as he wore a helmet, which contradicts the media's narrative that he died of a head injury. Let's see what Tucker has to say here. Within hours of January 6th, literally hours, you began to hear that day described as a deadly insurrection, and not described by one news outlet or one politician, but in unison by all of them, almost like it was coordinated, a deadly insurrection. That's how history may record January 6th. But the tape that we reviewed from within the building on that day proves it was neither an insurrection nor deadly. Here it is. January 6th, when an estimated 2,000 rioters breached the Capitol building, causing the deaths of five police officers. Certain dates echo throughout history. December 7th, 1941. September 11th, 2001. And January 6th, the mob beat officers with anything they had on them. Hockey stick, a flagpole, a fire extinguisher. Police officers died. Donald Trump supporters who, of course, rioted and killed police officers. By the evening of January 6th, the Democratic Party and its publicists in the national news media had settled on a description of what had happened that day. They distilled an enormous number of highly complex events, events that even now we don't fully understand, into a single emotionally related political slogan, which they've repeated for years with remarkable discipline. January 6th, they said, was a deadly insurrection. There was a deadly insurrection that the right wing is trying to cover up. He incited a deadly insurrection. Incited a deadly insurrection. The violent, deadly insurrection on the Capitol nine months ago it was about white supremacy, in my view. A deadly insurrection. Everything about that phrase is a lie. Very little about January 6th was organized or violent. Surveillance video from inside the Capitol shows mostly peaceful chaos. But the slogan worked. The term deadly carries enormous emotional power, which is why they used it. To prove the insurrection was deadly, propagandists pointed to the death of an officer called Brian Sicknick. The mob killed Officer Brian Sicknick. That's what they said. It was their single most powerful indictment of the January 6th protesters and of Donald Trump and of Republican voters nationally. They repeated that claim for years. They are still repeating it. At first, they told the country that Officer Sicknick was murdered with a fire extinguisher. Officer Brian Sicknick died after being hit in the head with a fire extinguisher during the fight. That story came from the New York Times, which is effectively the assignment editor for most of the rest of American media. It was a lie, untrue in any way. But only after that lie had hardened into conventional wisdom did the newspaper bother to retract it. The New York Times has quietly retracted its story about the death of Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick. And it is exactly what happens 99% of the time. They tell you a lie and then they'll wait and then they'll really quietly just kind of reel it back in and you'll never even know that they corrected it. And that's exactly how they get you every single time. And this is no exception. In fact, I really wish that this particular thing where they went back and re-edited the truth that they told everybody were bigger news because it would be a huge red pill to people who genuinely believe like the New York Times and the Washington Post and MSNBC and everybody who just constantly lies to people. Wild to me. Wild. Andy says, if the insurrection lasts longer than four hours, call a doctor immediately. Thank you for that advice. That is, as always, sage advice. 
Tucker Carlson shows never before seen footage from January 6th. It does prove beyond doubt that the Democrats in Congress, assisted by Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney, lied about what happened today. It's very difficult to view this any other way. They so clearly knew exactly what they were doing and they chose to do it anyway. Absolutely insane to me. Like, they were very, very careful. And now, like, we're going to listen to Mitch McConnell. And I kind of wanted to catch Chuck Schumer. We might see if we can find a clip from him as well. Um, we will never know which copyright takes us down this time. But I wanted to tell you, show you guys what McConnell was saying, because he is also on the side of the media and the Democrats in calling out Tucker Carlson's coverage of this. This is crazy. Listen to this. And Elon Musk also said he sometimes forgets which side um, Mitch McConnell is on. And somebody else said he does too. And I completely agree. This is absolutely the case. It's wild. Let's listen in here. Clearly, the chief of the Capitol Police, in my view, correctly describes what most of us witnessed firsthand on January 6th. So that's my reaction to it. Um, it was a mistake, in my view, for Fox News to depict this in a way that's completely at variance with what our chief law enforcement official here at the Capitol thinks. Absolutely not. Mitch McConnell is wrong as always. I have no idea what party he works for anymore. Look at his blue and yellow tie. He's clearly on board for Ukraine. He's full of nonsense and he should be the first to know that um, if the people at the Capitol are saying one thing, the total truth is probably the exact opposite. Let's see if we can find this Chuck Schumer thing. Oh, this is just for an hour ago. Fox News scores six times more viewers than CNN in primetime Tuesday. Yeah, good work, Chuck Schumer, for sure. Tucker Carlson responds to Senator Chuck Schumer calling for Fox News to censor his show. Those videos touch a nerve because they're a threat to the lies that Chuck Schumer's been telling for the last 26 months and not just Chuck Schumer. Molly Hemingway says, Dear Mitch McConnell, you were not elected to do the bidding of Chuck Schumer and CNN. Entirely correct. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, spot on. And the Babylon Bee says, Chuck Schumer warns Buffalo hat guy will crawl out of your TV and kill you if you watch Tucker's January 6 videos. I believe that's very similar to something that he said. Let me see if we can find his actual speech. Tucker Carlson. Might take a minute, but we got plenty of time this evening. All right, this is from the Gateway Pundit. Let's see if they have the actual video. I don't typically make a habit of using the Gateway Pundit. Okay, good. Yeah, Columbia Bugle's great. We like them. I don't find the Gateway Pundit to be particularly well-researched or well-verified. All right, let's listen to this one. Last night, millions of Americans tuned in to one of the most shameful hours we have ever seen on cable television. With contempt for the facts, disregard of the risks, and knowing full well he was lying, lying to his audience. Yes, lying by playing those videos from the surveillance cameras at the Capitol. Fox News host Tucker Carlson ran a lengthy segment last night arguing the January 6th Capitol attack was not a violent insurrection. Wow, he's worse of he's worse at reading off the paper than I am, and that's pretty impressive. Uh, the Columbia Bugle says they're freaking out now, big time, and I am kind of inclined to agree. It does smell like they're freaking out. Senator Schumer went down to the Senate floor this morning. That was yes, yesterday morning to condemn Tucker Carlson's January six tape segment last night. Call for Fox News and Rupert Murdoch to stop Tucker, Tucker Carlson from releasing another report on the January 6 tapes tonight. That was last night. And to repeat the lie that the death of about the death of Officer Sicknick. They go on. This is the lie that Chuck Schumer and uh, this is a lie. Chuck Schumer. Nice punctuation. And you know it. 
It's an insult to the memory of every single person who perished in connection to the January 6th attack, especially the memory of Brian Sicknick. Nonviolent? Ask the Sicknick family. They know they're telling a lie. They know the truth and they don't care. They are operating under the literal Nazi assumption that if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. And it seems to be working. Like people are, people are truly believing this and it's wild to me, but I can't change everybody's belief systems. I can only kind of point people in the right direction. Hopefully that will help solve some of these problems. Tucker Carlson's report on the never before seen footage of Officer Brian Sicknick on January 6th. To this day, media accounts describe him as someone who was slain on January 6th. Right. And as we said before, he was looking healthy and vigorous, just walking around hours after they said that he had died at the riot. It's crazy to me. Yeah. So all of this stuff is coming out and I'm so happy to see it. I am so happy to see it. Um, so T Chuck Schumer says Tucker Carlson is siding with the enemies of democracy. Here's what I said on the Senate floor. Yeah. And the Columbia Bugle points out the polling ain't on your side, Chuck. And they're entirely correct. Entirely correct. Fox News is getting huge numbers, much bigger than many late night hosts. Like I think the five on Fox is blowing all the rest of them out of the water. And Tucker, of course, is one of the most popular nighttime um, anchors on any network, which should really be kind of telling. And Chuck Schumer should probably kind of be paying attention and kind of reading the room. I'm just saying. Matthew Merrill says, Streisand effect anyone? Great point. Hadn't even thought about that. They're all like, don't look over in this corner. There's nothing over there. Don't look over there. It's not a big deal. No one should be looking there. It's fine. Serenko says it's so disingenuous. Tucker literally started his program with a video of the violence. That's correct. He didn't waste time. He just threw it out there and he's like, here's what happened. And they're all saying he lied, which is really, really effing fascinating, isn't it? Because he didn't. All he did was say, here, look at the information and then we'll see what conclusions you draw and I'll tell you what conclusions I, I draw. Elon's reply to Schumer's J6 propaganda is funny. I did not see that one. Thank you, Keenan. Miss Anthrope says you can almost see where Schumer filed his horns. Yeah, he is not a good person. And I think it was, no, Tucker Carlson said that um, Adam Schiff gave him such vibes of like incredible darkness, like actual some kind of spiritual possession, which was really interesting to me because from my understanding, Tucker is not a particularly religious guy. But let's talk about illegal drugs because Oklahoma just voted outright to reject legalization of recreational marijuana. I'm using this hand sign unintentionally, but it is very funny. Yesterday, voters in Oklahoma rejected a ballot measure that would have legalized recreational marijuana in the state for adults age 21 and older. Interesting. That's a very, very short description. What do you guys think about that? I was in Colorado when weed was legalized there as the first state in the country to do that. And it did not improve the condition of our state pretty much at all. Mostly what we saw was people flooding, flooding into this um, location, basically just our cities and towns who were coming to work in the pot industry and they ended up not being able to find work. So they just became homeless which was kind of terrible because it gets pretty cold in Colorado in the winter. Um, and I just remember thinking, wow, this is such a great plan. And they're just like, look, we'll get so much money from this. We'll be able to fill our potholes. It's going to be awesome. None of that happened. Literally nothing happened. The only sign that I saw of the change after the marijuana bill passed was that every morning when I would drive to the hospital, I had to drive down a road that went right past a bunch of dispensaries and constantly smelled the smell of weed every morning at like 5 30 or whenever it was that I was driving past. It was first of all disgusting because I hate the smell of weed, but it did not have a significant improvement to the state of the state. Now I know it's a difference if we're not arresting people for simple marijuana possession. I think that's something that never should have happened. But at the same time, I think that there is an entire crowd of people who are constantly talking about how Marijuana cures cancer, it makes everything better, it soothes your nerves, it gets rid of all this, 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 and this. I understand the role that CBD can play in some of that stuff. Now, CBD can help with a lot of that stuff. In fact, from my understanding, it actually can help with some seizure disorders, which is great if it does, but let's be real, nothing and no one has any cure for every single thing. Um, I hear a lot of talk about cancer and everybody's like, there's no cure for cancer because there's no money in curing cancer. 
And you just have to stop and say, are you aware of how many hundreds of types of cancer there are? Are you aware that all of them are based on different issues? All of them come from different sources. There is no cure for cancer. Cancer is not a thing. There are so many different kinds of cancer affected by so many different factors. It's impossible to say, well, marijuana would cure cancer, but they don't let us do it because, you know, uh, it wouldn't get them any money. And don't get me wrong. I have no great love for Pfizer or Moderna. I'm just saying, I don't think that's why there's no cure for cancer. Remember Biden rolled into office with this talk of a moonshot to cure cancer. And I was just like, it's never going to happen. And we know exactly why anyone who knows anything about any kind of science, like have a very rudimentary knowledge of the basic elements of science. And I know that there is no single cure for cancer. It's not going to be weed. It's not going to be any one thing. But speaking of illegal drugs, again, the White House opposes designating drug cartels as terrorist organizations. What do you guys think about this? Because when I was listening to Scott Adams a little while ago, I stopped listening to him for whatever reason before his big scandal. Um, But he was constantly talking about because he had a stepson who died of an overdose. It was his only issue. He was a single issue voter. He wanted the U.S. government to weaponize the powers of the government and the military against the Mexican cartel and end the illegal drug trade. And I was like... Okay, interesting, maybe. And I always thought that he should bring on a libertarian who likes the idea of freeing up all of the restrictions around this stuff. And they should talk about whether it would be better to make all of this stuff legal or whether they should just send over the military and basically declare war on the cartels until all of this stuff stopped. Because we know that when they legalized marijuana, one of the other good things that happened because of it was that the price of marijuana or rather, I forget what it was, the demand and the price changed because we were able to grow it in the U.S. instead of needing it to be trafficked over the border by the cartels. That was a big uh, big tool in kind of pushing back on the illegal, cri- the illegal drug syndicate. Designating these cartels as FTOs, foreign terrorist organizations, would not grant us any additional authority we don't really have at this time, Jean-Pierre said. The Biden administration Wednesday announced it would not support efforts to brand Mexican drug cartels foreign terrorist organizations, indicating such a move would provide little value in combating their operations. Designating these cartels as FTOs would not grant us any authorities we don't already have. The U.S. has powerful sanction authorities specifically designated to combat narcotics trafficking organizations and the individuals and entities that enable them. Yeah, but it's not working. I think that's what everybody's arguing. They're like, okay, so what we're doing right now, that's not working. The whole open border policy thing, that's not working. It's just not. And they don't really seem to care about that, which is a little bit of a problem, I have to say. In fact, I want to talk about, um, let's see here. I can't find it. Oh yeah, here we go. Biden's catch and release border policy was struck down by a U.S. judge. So this is kind of interesting. Let's learn about this a little bit. A federal judge in Florida on Wednesday agreed with the state's Republican attorney general that the policy of President Joe Biden's administration to release many people who illegally cross the U.S.-Mexico border rather than detaining them violates U.S. immigration law. Of course it does. I can't believe this needed to go to a judge. U.S. District Judge T. Kent Weatherell in Pensacola blocked the administration from continuing to implement a 2021 Department of Homeland Security memo that had authorized alternatives to detention to ease overcrowding in detention facilities. These alternatives included ankle bracelets, phone monitoring, or check-ins by immigration officers. Republican critics called the policy catch and release. That is very much exactly what it sounds like. Weatherell, appointed by Republican former President Donald Trump, said federal immigration of immigration authorities lack the power to implement these alternatives as a widespread basis under existing law. The judge agreed with the argument made by Florida Attorney General Ashley Moody, who challenged the policy. Defendants have effectively turned the southwest border into a meaningless line in the sand and little more than a speed bump for aliens flooding into the country. Now, I don't often talk about the border policy because it's so frustrating to me to watch all this happening. I see all the crime that's being committed by the people that cross the border. Not only are they breaking the law when they enter our country illegally, they're also opening the door to crimes like human trafficking and they're putting other people at risk. And I just have such a huge problem with that. It's very frustrating to see it happening. Now, 
If Chuck were in office, we could have a good hearted, like a good faith conversation about what exactly he might be doing wrong. But looking at the Biden administration, as far as I'm concerned, they're literally just doing every single thing wrong. And I don't really know even where to begin. But this does seem like a good start. I'm happy to hear it. Let's go to the bottom and see if we can see the impact of this. Florida and 19 other Republican-led states are separately challenging another administration policy that would allow hundreds of thousands of people from Cuba, Haiti, Venezuela, and Nicaragua to be released into the U.S. rather than detained for a year. Good. I hope they win on that one for sure. Eric writes, thank you, sir, for the super chat. Fentanyl coming from Mexico mixed into everything from heroin all the way to soft drinks is killing 100,000 person people per year, more than we lost in Vietnam. If that's not terrorism slash war, then what is? Yes, that's a great point. And a lot of that fentanyl, or at least the ingredients for the fentanyl, are actually coming from, you guessed it, China. This isn't originating in Mexico. The cartel is just the messenger bringing the message from China. It's crazy to me. Keenan says it's not a speed bump, it's an accelerator. Yeah, and we've had people, we have immigrants on record saying that we decided to come to the U.S. because Joe Biden is in office. And that's such a stunning indictment. I think it's just terribly disturbing and they should really take it much more seriously than they are, but they don't care about that because they can't virtue signal about that. They can't virtue signal like they did today when they awarded a biological man a Woman's Day Award. The most insulting nonsense you'll ever hear comes from this administration. It's crazy. Speaking of craziness with this administration, I want to pop right over to this one because it's really interesting to me. FBI whistleblowers send shockwaves with warning that threat tags used to target conservatives. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan decried the FBI's emerging pattern of targeting parents, traditional Catholics, and pro-lifers with threat tags. What do school parents, Catholic attendees of Latin Mass, and pro-life activists have in common? They've all been branded by the FBI, by the FBI, as potential domestic terrorist threats in what whistleblowers say is a growing trend of using intelligence threat tra- tags to enforce cancel culture. This is this is the natural result of cancel culture. I could have told you when this first started happening that this would be exactly what happened. You had to know that eventually cancel culture would be weaponized to the point that our so-called intelligence agencies would be using it to call people of groups that they didn't like terrorists just because they didn't like them. The latest revelation came this past weekend when House Republicans released testimony from an FBI whistleblower who alleged colleagues in the bureau flipped a terrorist threat threat tag originally created to flag threats against pro-life Supreme Court justices into a signifier that anti-abortion protesters were somehow a threat. The revelation came months after confirmation that similar threat tags were reserved for parents raising concerns about curriculum at school board meetings and the disclosure of an FBI memo suggesting Catholics who prefer the legacy Latin mass posed a risk of extremist violence. We can recall easily because we talked about this yesterday, but that particular pointer came from the extreme leftist Southern Poverty Law, Poverty Law Center, whose own lawyer, need I repeat, was just arrested for literal domestic terrorism in Atlanta. Representative Jim Jordan, chairman of the powerful House Judiciary Committee, told Just the News on Tuesday, the pattern is a disturbing new trend. And the political weaponization of federal law enforcement that can be traced all the way back to the launch of the Russian collusion probe targeting Donald Trump in 2016 based on uncorroborated allegations from his Democrat rival Hillary Clinton's campaign. If it's targeting parents, that's one thing, Jordan said on the John Solomon Reports podcast. Traditional Catholics, okay, well, that's a concern too. But when it gets to be three, which is what we learned from a whistleblower when he said they were targeting pro-lifers, Now we see a pattern, right? So it's parents, traditional Catholics, pro-lifers, all are wrong. Now it's a pattern. In testimony released this weekend, FBI whistleblower Garrett O'Boyle told congressional investigators the Bureau issued guidance following the Dobbs abortion decision that overturned Roe v. Wade so agents could, quote, look into pregnancy centers using the tag threat to SCOTUS 2022. Now, When Roe was overturned, was there really a threat to SCOTUS coming from the right? And I really need the FBI to be fully honest with me on this one because we all know 
damn well that there was no threat to SCOTUS coming from the right with the overturn of Roe. It was entirely from the left. In fact, a leftist was caught with weapons on the way to Justice Kavanaugh's house, saying that he intended not just to kill the judge, but also his entire family. O'Boyle found this strange, he testified, because it was pro-choice activists who were protesting or otherwise threatening violence in front of Supreme Court justices' houses, yes, but they saw an excuse and they took it. He was asked to talk to a pro-life informant about the threats to the Supreme Court, he testified. I was like, why would this person know about those threats? He's pro-life. Like, he's not the one going and threatening the Supreme Court justices. O'Boyle never received guidance from the FBI to look into attacks on pro-life facilities, churches, or pregnancy resource centers, he told Congress, congressional investigators, illustrating how the threat tag was turned on its head to target pro-lifers instead of radicalized pro-choice supporters as it was originally intended. He went on to describe how the Bureau made him divide one domestic terrorism case into four separate ones to give the appearance of a bigger caseload. This was done, he said, to give lawmakers conducting oversight the appearance of a spike in domestic terror so as to increase funding. That's right. I remember this, too. Remember when all of the Democrats were saying there's a spike in domestic terrorism from white nationalists? But we heard from the FBI, FBI agents just like O'Boyle, that this actually wasn't the case. They were actually seeing no change at all from the radical right. He went on to describe how the Bureau made him a divide one domestic terrorism. Right, right. We talked about that. It was one case, but the FBI had me open up four different cases, he recounted, because they had me open a case for every individual that I had an articulable factual basis that there, that there may have been potential federal law being violated. O'Boyle alleges he was suspended by the FBI in retaliation for making protected whistleblowers disclosures to Congress. After he was suspended, he testified the FBI denied him access for more than a month to his family's personal belongings held in storage with a company contracted by the Bureau in Virginia, forcing him and his wife to rely on family members to provide clothing for the three children. Wow, they are class acts over there. He told Congress he ultimately spent around $10,000 to retrieve these belongings. God bless him, though, for coming forward, Jordan said Wednesday. They believe in the Constitution. They believe in the First Amendment. I actually think that this is the biggest concern we have. This attack on speech and the web of the, this web of people, this web of censorship is so scary. It's one of the things we're really going to try to focus on on the committee, as well as the double standard we see, one set of rules for the connected class, another set if you don't have the right political view. O'Boyle accused the federal government of persecuting him for speaking out and claimed they did it maliciously knowing how difficult they were going to make it for me. And I thought the FBI was being weaponized against agents or anybody who wanted to step forward and talk about malfeasance inside the agency prior to this, he concluded. But now after what's happened to me, I don't think I can ever be convinced that it's anything other than that. For sure, I completely agree. Well, it's very hard to deny that. They literally told him that he couldn't have access to his own personal belonging for belongings for months just because the FBI was technically in charge of the storage facility where it was held. But this is not the only thing that troubling thing that's coming out of the federal government lately uh, and some of these intelligence agencies. And we touched on this a little bit yesterday, but Breitbart kind of unpacks it for us more. Thank you, Eric, again for your super chat. Happy to catch you live again, live again, live. Very strange question. Very strange question because I'm of divided mind on is it on it. Is it better that a civil war happen now rather than allowing more power to be added to the metaphor powder to be added to the metaphorical keg? No, and I don't think the civil war is going to take place with guns and ammo and stuff like that. I think it's going to happen very peacefully. I think it's going to happen as the U.S. divides along ideological lines. I think it's going to go right into where do you spend your money? Are you going to find companies that agree with you or are you going to continue to send your money to you know, Harry's Razors and Hershey's Chocolate and all of these other companies that you know hate you? Or are you going to find somewhere better, somewhere else, someplace that agrees with you and supports you? I think the latter will happen. It's going to be a lot easier and a lot more peaceful and less stressful. And I kind of see it shaking out that way. And I think personally that that's great. I think that's how it should be. All right, you guys, this one is titled FTC Slammed for requesting names of Twitter files journalists. The FTC is again going after is going after journalists who were given access to the Twitter files, demanding a list of names of journalists who Twitter granted access to as part of the agency's increasingly aggressive approach against the platform. 
In a series of letters sent to Twitter by the FTC, the powerful regulatory body requested a swath of information from the social media platform, including the names of the Twitter files, journalists, and Elon Musk's personal communications. Very interesting that the government wants this because I've been told for decades now that these are private companies that can do whatever they want. And the First Amendment doesn't really apply to them because they are private um, private companies. In its correspondence, the FTC claimed user privacy was one of its top concerns. Of course, you're only, only concerned with people's privacy and protecting that. We are concerned that these staff reductions impact Twitter's ability to protect consumers' information, wrote the FTC. Matt Taibbi, a journalist who's published a number of the Twitter files, pointed out that the Twitter files disclosures proved that the government made numerous improper requests for user data from Twitter, something the FTC seems less concerned about. While Twitter files reporters neither asked for nor received access to the private user data, the files themselves are full of instances of government agencies improperly asking for the same. Yes, not surprising at all. If you guys recall from the Twitter files, that was a huge part of what the government was going for. They wanted these people's user information. They wanted to find ways to cancel them. They wanted to remove them from the platform. In December, Twitter files reporter Michael Schellenberger disclosed the FBI's request for private user data from Twitter, something the company refused at the time. Thank goodness, right? We talked about that yesterday. The FBI repeatedly requests information from Twitter that Twitter has already made clear it will not share outside of normal legal channels, he reported. The email posted by Schellenberger, the FBI requests information on the VPN service providers used by targeted users, a request that would likely have com compromised their privacy and a request that Twitter refused. We would need legal process to provide further information about the IPs, subnets, providers, etc. associated with the authentication IPs of these accounts. Twitter employee Yoel Roth responded, and honestly, good for him. They were the only thing standing between the federal government and your personal private information. Definitely, definitely appreciate their efforts there even though they were wrong in many other regards. The FTC's actions have drawn the fire of Representative Jim Jordan, who we just talked about, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. This may be the most egregious threat to the First Amendment I've ever seen, um, and this harassment of Twitter started when Elon Musk bought the company. I think 12 different letters they sent in the span of like two months. This, the most egregious part, in my judgment, was the idea that they're going after a journalist and they even named personally some journalists in there who were part of the Twitter files. And this article is by Alan Bakari, whom we like and enjoy a lot. He's definitely on top of all the tech stuff. I really am grateful that Jim Jordan is also on top of a lot of this stuff. This is so important that you push back on this kind of thing because there is no other way to kind of push the government to reduce its grip and power. And it's very unlikely that the government will in any case. But let's continue on. Oh, you know what? I should have mentioned this earlier with the Tucker Carlson stuff. Let's see if we can loop it back in now. Chuck Schumer, speak of him refused to go on Tucker Carlson tonight to discuss his demand that the January 6 tapes be suppressed. I was invited on Tucker Carlson's show, the New York Senator wrote, I will agree to go on after Tucker Carlson admits to his viewers live on air that he's been lying to them about the 2020 election and what happened on January 6th. Chuck, shut the F up. What has he lied to them about? All he did was show them footage, like actual evidence of what happened on that day. Chuck Schumer is always, always, always only ever operating in bad faith. And we know this, but it doesn't make it any less frustrating. Ugh, gross. The challenge came after Carlson began sharing video evidence. Many peaceful protesters were led inside the Capitol building by police. This we know. Last night, millions of Americans tuned into one of the most shameful hours we've ever seen on cable television, Schumer said Tuesday. With contempt for the facts, disregard for the risks. What risks? What contempt for the facts did he show? Chuck, would love for you to sit down and walk us all through that because that just doesn't make any sense. To me, that just looks like partisanship and other such nonsense. Well, let's touch on this um, ridiculous story out of Florida. We love our Florida stories, but this is really something special. From Susanna Bryan. Let's see who she is. She is... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, there we go. Susanna is a reporter at the Sun Sentinel covering Fort Lauderdale. She's a dog owner. Good, good. Yeah, okay. Truth seeker. A hornet's nest kicker. A rare Florida ma uh, 
native, excuse me. This is what she has to say, and I'll show you guys the ratio. From a Fort Lauderdale source, it appears that the pride flag at Sebastian and Seabreeze has been possibly defaced less than a month after its debut. Shameful. Some are hoping surveillance cameras might shed light on who did this. Some being Susanna, I assume. Oh my gosh. There are car tires on this sign that was painted on the road. What are we to make of this? This is crazy. Holy cow. I cannot believe that someone defaced the new American flag like this. This is truly scandalous. So let's see what this ratio looks like. I'm going to click on my tweet to watch ratio because I always tag them in amazing ratios like this. And here we have almost 4,000 comments and 198 likes and 588 retweets. And I'm assuming most of those retweets are truly mocking her. Yeah, for sure. Here we have all like quote tweets, ridiculous. Why do I need a rainbow propaganda flag on every corner? The flag's a political statement, nothing more. Can this be considered asphalt and battery? That's a great question. Surveillance cameras have revealed the vandal's shocking identity and it is Mario Kart and the gang. The worst attack on our democracy since the Civil War, literally shaking right now. This national news story, viewed 1.4 million times, involves tire marks on a street. Genuinely hope they don't find the kids drag racing and give them 10 years. Yeah, they actually did find the guy. Um, I'm not sure if they figured out who he actually is, but John is correct when he says, oof, the ratio and the replies. Yes, no one has any patience for them. This is absolutely insane, and I'm disturbed that it's coming out of Florida. But I guess there are crazy people in every state. And as we know about Florida, if you know anything about Florida man, based mostly on Florida's sunshine laws, which make their crime reporting very interesting because you can learn all sorts of information about the people who committed the crimes, <coughs> excuse me, and the crimes themselves. If you guys didn't know this about um, Florida's sunshine laws, they are a lot more open about all of the crimes, the individual crimes committed in the state's in the state than many other states are. So it turns out it's not actually Florida man who's crazy, despite all of the continued exposure to alligators and whatnot. This is the case in every American state. We just don't hear about it as much, which I've always found kind of interesting to reflect on for sure. Here is some good news for sure. And then I think we're going to round this off a little bit early tonight. Bipartisan group of senators unveil TikTok ban bill. Good. A dozen Demo Republican and Democratic senators have joined forces with a proposal that could pose a threat to the future of the popular social media platform in the United States. And I just want to stop and ask you guys, do you remember when Donald Trump was mulling banning TikTok and all of the kids were freaking out and the Democrats were having a ridiculous reaction to it too? But I repeat myself when I say kids and Democrats. Imagine what a better condition our country would be in today if Donald Trump had actually had the testicular fortitude to follow through on that. I really do think it would be a lot better than it is today. It's genuinely disturbing how bad it's gotten. I was listening to something the other day about how quickly young people, uh, if you set up a, a, an account on TikTok and you just start browsing around, they say it takes a shockingly short period of time for you to be directly exposed to all kinds of drug propaganda and all of this conversation about illegal drugs, making it cool, encouraging you to take it, which is perfectly in line with our understanding of where fentanyl comes from and where TikTok is also from. We know TikTok's from China. We know fentanyl's from China. So of course, they're trying to hawk their number one product with their other top selling product. The White House is reportedly applauding a new U.S. Senate bill that would give the Biden administration, <coughs> excuse me, new authority to ban the Chinese owned video app TikTok, deeming it a threat to American national security. Yeah, it's about darn time, but it's not just about American national security. And we know this. This is about the mental health of our young people. And I'm so, as always, I'm so incredibly distressed by the absolute state of American parents, because these are the parents that we see taking their babies to drag shows. These are the parents that we see allowing their children to spend all day on TikTok, to spend all day, every day, just scrolling through every conceivable form of social media. And it's just like, this is a serious problem. The biggest problem that we have in this country is 
the fact that our parents are lacking, which is indeed a very big cultural issue and not one that we can solve at the drop of a hat. Parents aren't interested in parenting their children. They want to just be able to have their kids sit down with an iPad and leave them alone and not worry about taking care of them, not worry about talking to them, entertaining them, making sure that they are actively engaged with the world around them. They just end up saying, here's your iPad, leave me alone. And then they send them back to the state sponsored school and they keep them on Ritalin and Adderall to keep them conditioned to quote, learn. And then they end up being churned through the system. They end up coming out, repeating the typical lines about critical race theory and dissatisfaction with other factions of society. And it's just not at all surprising. And the key issue here between the drag queen babies, because those babies did not get there on their own, and TikTok kids being influenced by these horrible things is the parents being unwilling to say, no, that's not going to happen. No, of course I'm not taking my baby to a drag queen story hour. Are you insane? Or parents who are unwilling to say, no, you know what? I don't think you should spend extra time on TikTok. I don't think you should scroll Instagram if you're a teenage girl. It's very bad for you. It's bad for your self-esteem. It's bad for your body image. Parents just aren't saying that. They're simply not having the impact that they should. They have kids and they're like, okay, cool. I'll coach them through the first few years of their life and then I'll pawn them off on the state. And then the state will teach them whatever it is that the country needs them to know. And then they'll go on into the world knowing the things that the nation needs them to know. And I will have nothing to say about what happens to them either then or now. It doesn't really matter. They're not really interesting. They're not really unique. I could have killed them before they were born. They mean nothing to me or anyone else. They're just another brick in the wall. Literally. They don't matter at all. State schools, state sponsorship. Jeez, it's really, really frustrating and hard to watch, but... It's just another one of those cultural issues that we must work on fixing because it's just not something that's going to go away on its own and it's certainly not going to be quick. Andy says, like, comment, share, subscribe for sure. Ekim says, aren't you in Colorado? Why the Pakistan flag? Did I miss the reference? Okay, first of all, no, not in Colorado. Thanks for asking, but that is where I was raised. I'm a Colorado native. It's not a Pakistan flag. I know our attention spans are very, very short, but in Turkey, over the last month or so, almost 50,000 people died in earthquakes. And I know everyone's immediately forgotten because the next most interesting thing that came along and happened just caught their attention immediately. But hundreds of thousands of people are still affected by massive massive global turmoil over in Turkey and no one's talking about it anymore. And that's why I keep the Turkish flag in my handle because I don't want people to forget that. So thank you for asking. I will continue to say it for the foreseeable future. Psycho Clown says more burnouts feel needed on that paint on the road. Burnouts for everyone. Yeah, great idea. Andy says there's no law against screeching your tires on a road. That's right. That's a burnout. Lori says, vandalism on paint on pavement. Yes, I don't know exactly what they expected when they decided to paint on the road. Like, they really didn't think that one through because I don't know if you've ever seen a road. (laughs) But they are just covered in tire marks. People do have to stop, which means that their tires leave marks sometimes, especially if they have to stop fast, especially if they start fast, especially if they do a burnout. Eric says, I think it's just TikTok on government devices, though. Well, that would be a start. I think they should ban it outright from all phones in the country. Plus one like. Thank you, Suvili. That's correct, Eric. Yes, it is indeed a start that it's on government devices. Hopefully we can get it on um, all of the other ones as well. Eric says, intestinal fortitude. No, the word is testicular fortitude, unfortunately. And he says, every like on this video is another hour of J6 footage released. That's right. That is the promise. Eric says, well, I like the way you said it better, but I think what I said in the, is the original phrase. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Oh, intestinal fortitude. I've heard both of them, to be fair. I just like testicular better because it's a way that you can say that in polite company and not have people look askance at you. Everybody smile says, looking at a starting BJJ with my son to drag him away from video games. He actually seems excited about it. Yes. Do it. It's going to be great for you. It's going to be great for your son. It's going to give him an outlet for his masculine urges, for his tendencies toward 
testosterone laden activities. I am really encouraging Andy to do that too. You guys know his hobby is rollerblading and he's really great at that, but we do have a BJJ gym nearby. And I really think that he would make a lot of friends there. So you guys in the chat, tell him that he needs to join the BJJ gym. I think that's a great idea for young men and for middle-aged men and everybody in between. Eric says, my daughters have an uh, even better shot of getting into good school slash getting good jobs. I hear you and it sucks, but it's nothing new. Keenan says, Peter Pan hook TikTok. Who's afraid of a clock? Indeed, everyone's afraid of a clock. No one likes the idea of time passing by. Stoicism was really onto something when they told us to embrace the concept of the worst possible thing happening. Andy says, I'd really like to get into BJJ this year. Yes, I would love for that. Everybody says, everybody smile says, I'll have to let you know how it goes for sure. BJJ, Eric, for you is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu. This is what Joe Rogan is into. Yeah. Eric says, did rolling in basic stuff while I was in tech school for biomedical engineering in the USAF. Start as young as you can and good luck. Yeah. Well, we are where we are. So you just start where you are and go for it. And he says it's more than 900 billion jujitsus. Yes, that is the exact number of a Brazilian. I think that was George W. Bush who asked how many was a Brazilian. I thought that was hilarious. Ikim says, my bad, I remember my error was not recognizing the flag, then forgetting. Yes, so that is the Turkish flag. And I will keep it there to keep reminding people that they are still struggling and there's still definitely work that should be done over there. And he says, this is a family radicalization propaganda video. Interesting, I'm not sure why. OCB says balls or guts, LOL. Yes, you need both for sure to make a strong stance for sure. Yes, so the, um, the uh, what's it called? The lectern behind me, which you can't read the text on it, I don't think. It says House Speaker Leiterman. It was actually designed and created by the lectern guy who was at the January 6th riot. I love it very much. It was a gift from him. He didn't make any money off of it. And it's awesome. I see references to it. He did Ron Paul as well, but no store or anything. Not sure what you guys are talking about. Oh yeah, the Milton Friedman in on this noise. So behind me is the statue that Andy gave me right by our wedding picture. He didn't give it to me. He put it here on our shelves and I believe that is Milton Friedman. I'm not sure. I actually don't know. Andy is welcome to correct me on that. I believe that's Milton Friedman. Not sure about that. Hero 92 says we need the Marines and Navy SEALs and Air Force to take them out. The precursors are one thing and I hear you. Oh, China isn't making it. They're just helping. Yeah, I think that China might also partly be making it, but we can do more research into that. Where do you think all oh, the news jobs Democrats brag about go? I'm not sure. Sorenko says the issue with weed is that people don't have self-control and abuse it. So people do that with alcohol as well. So yes, and alcohol is certainly more dangerous to you, but I also don't like the idea of giving everybody access to marijuana, especially since we know that THC edibles end up in the hands of children who think they're candy, who then eat as many as they find and end up in the hospital. That is really, really awful. And like I was just ranting about parents not taking full responsibility for their kids, this is another case of that. They take no care about making sure that their children can't get a hold of this stuff. And this is the same reason that kids end up taking guns to school because their parents just leave them out. There was a horrible case of a six-year-old, I think, in Virginia who ended up shooting his teacher because he got a hold of one of his parents' weapons and took it to school and ended up firing it at her. It was truly horrifying. Really, really an awful instance, but I don't know. Oh, uh, interesting. Maryland Democrats seeking to prohibit anyone under the age of 25 from being charged with felony murder, citing that their brains aren't fully developed, though. Interesting. A specific codified offense where you're guilty of murder because you intentionally committed a felony which caused the murder, even if you didn't intend to commit murder. They're going to charge them as juveniles while they're still able to vote. Yes, that's what it looks like. So that is from a couple days ago. This is a very interesting case. So Democrat reasoning is you can change your gender when you're three years old, but if you are charged with a crime... Even if you're about the age 24, 25, you still will not be considered an adult because, quote, your brain isn't fully developed. How about we apply that reasoning to both cases? You can't change your gender until you're 25 years old, period. And if you insist, we also won't charge people under the age of 25 with felony murder because you said it, not me. Their brains aren't fully developed yet. That's a very 
very interesting case to make. I kind of like that. Let's go in that direction. All right, you guys. Thank you guys very much for joining me. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Andy says that would be a great goal. We'd love to have him on if he'll have us for sure. Thomas, so will bust as well. Andy says I'm 37 as well, but my joints. Oh yeah, Murray Rothbard. Thank you, Eric. I forgot. I'm 37 as well, but my joints are well over 100 after 30 years of skating. That's right. Got to get him get it. Got got to get him into yoga. Kind of loosen up his joints. Do some kind of flexibility training for sure because those joints have seen a lot of wear and tear. I know it's no joke. Eric says he's six. Awesome. Yeah, that would be awesome. Good, good stuff. And he says, Eric, Eric says Andy might need to travel to California to interview him in person. That would be very cool for sure. All right, you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Sorry, I'm so spaced out tonight and the news was kind of weird, but we had a great time anyway. I really appreciate all you guys joining me. If you see anything interesting for sure, tweet it at me. From my understanding too, I will let you guys know this now. I'm going to be hosting a Twitter spaces or that like Twitter conversation place. Let me see what it's actually called. There's Twitter blue. I forget what they're called. We're going to go to, it's not Twitter circle. Crap. I forget what they're called. I think it's a Twitter space where you like open up a conversation with other people and then people can listen in. It's like a live podcast. Anyway, I'm going to be doing that with the authors of Stolen Innocence, I think it's called, which is Carol um, and Bethany Mandel. And I'm so excited. Stolen. And I keep hearing about Stolen Innocence from, I think it's Stolen Youth. Mm, yeah. Bethany Mandel and Carol Markowitz. Yeah. So let me get, show you guys this book. And we're going to be talking to both these authors on Monday of next week at 730. So after the show, Stolen Youth, How Radicals Are Erasing Innocence and da, da, da. Your children belong to you, not a school and indoctrinating a general generation for sure. Yeah. Really, really neat conversation. I'm sure we will have. I'm very excited for it. It's going to be a great conversation. I know and appreciate both of these ladies. And I really think that it's going to be awesome. And I'm looking forward to what they have to say because it's very similar to what I was talking about earlier. So tune in for sure next Monday, the 13th, and we will be talking to them at 730. All right, you guys, I will see you all tomorrow. Until next time, same time, same place. Bye guys. How's it going?